Hello everyone on this hot, humid Thursday night here in Rhode Island. This is Derek Ferreira here with you and another weekly vlog I can say. And I know I've been cutting down on vlogs because I also got to focus on my other projects like wrestling and sports which is going to be coming back pretty soon. But... I still want to keep talking about COVID-19, coronavirus, because there is going to be a ripple effect to this coronavirus during this election season. And what is the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic going to do right in the midst of the election season? That may sound like a rather crass question to be asking right now. But let me state that this is undeniably going to involve a lot of people dying. That probably could have been prevented from dying. And we know this is going to be an ongoing tragedy for all. We have been seeing an abomination with this crisis. With this COVID-19. And I'm pulling off the statistics right now on my computer. Because, quite frankly, I don't know how this is getting out of control. You look at the deaths in this country. 126,780 people have died from this COVID-19. You look at the cases. We broke a single record today. 40,184 cases of COVID. It's a lot. Here in Rhode Island, 40 cases. 649 people died. But you know that's going to get worse. And the total we eventually reach is going to depend in large part of how big this second wave turns out to be. That represents widespread human suffering on a massive scale. But it's also going to affect the politics of this election season. One way or another. Which is what I'm choosing to focus on today. Many are now quibbling over the terminology, which is kind of pointless. Is it truly a second wave? A second part of the first? Is it wave 1.5 or wave 2.0? I got an answer for you on that. Who the fuck cares what you call it? Just acknowledge that it exists. Epidemiologists could split these hairs later. And that's when they look back at all of the data. For now, and this is just my opinion, it's hair. We're in a second spike in the caseload. No matter what you ultimately decide, it should be called. So for your sake, as far as I'm concerned, it is a second wave. Plain and simple. You look at the seven-day average for the number of new cases reported each day. Shows that this second wave developing in the past week or so. When this pandemic started, we saw a sharp spike of over 30,000 new cases per day. And that was in February and March. Eventually, this started slowly shrinking, and then we reached a plateau of around 20,000 cases per day. But last month is when many governors decided, you know what? We have to reopen our economy. And if there's one thing that I agree with our president, 
The economy wasn't meant to be shut down. But what we're seeing now is, after accounting for the built-in lag time, a direct result of all of this reopening last month, the problem with that built-in lag time, though, is that we really only measured the spread of the virus roughly three weeks ago. And those three weeks have already happened, meaning nothing anybody does now will have the slightest effect on the numbers for the next two or three weeks. The likelihood is that the spike we're currently experiencing, as I mentioned, we went over 40,000 cases today, it's going to get even worse for the foreseeable future. And nobody knows where it's going to top out. It could just stay where it is now. It could climb to 35,000 or even 40,000 new cases per day. Nobody really knows. The really alarming thing about the numbers is the slope of the graph. Look at any of the seven-day average graphs to see what I'm talking about. Go on these coronavirus websites that have a graph. The caseload did not gradually creep back up to where it was at the peak of the first wave. Instead, it shot up within a week's time. That's very concerning since, again, nobody now knows where it'll peak. The curve is bending, but in precisely the wrong direction. And there's a political argument going on about how concerning all this should be, which mostly centers around an argument that the new cases we're seeing now is only a function of the widespread testing we're finally doing. To put it another way, if we had been testing at the level we now are back, that we are now doing now, if we were doing this back in March, April, and May, I'm going to say the same thing too. The numbers would have been worse back then. There are a huge number of new cases beyond what it was before. We're just identifying more of them. That's all. This argument doesn't hold water for a few reasons. Because the most obvious to see is that increased testing nationwide has not shown a uniform raise in cases in all states. In roughly half the states... The numbers are actually going down. Look at the Northeast. Look at Rhode Island. Look at Massachusetts. Connecticut. New York. The Northeast. We did the right thing. And we're proving to these Southerners. If you want to control this virus. You have to do the same philosophy that the Northeast did. But what's happening in the South? They're going up. So if increased caseload was merely a function of increased testing, this will not be true. We'll be seeing more cases everywhere. The other rather concerning thing about this current spike is that it runs counter to one big prediction that sucks. And yes, I am calling out Donald Trump on this. Donald Trump said that the virus would recede in the summertime because viruses in general don't like hot weather. Okay. <laughs> the spike that we're now seeing is centered in the Sun Belt states. And those are the states where the temperatures are the highest. Right as we head into the summer. There has been no general abatement. And COVID-19 seems to spread just fine in hot climates. So what does this mean politically? Well, that too is kind of unnotable. Due to all of the unique circumstances we're all now in. We've never had a president who seems to think if they... Clap their hands real hard that the virus will quietly go away. We haven't seen a pandemic like this since 1918. 
in over a century. So how will it affect today's politics? It's anyone's guess. <coughs> Governors, even ones from the Republican states that reopened as early as they possibly could, what are they doing now? They've announced that they are repausing their reopening plans. But pausing isn't restituting stricter control on society. If things get worse, if hospitals in entire cities become overwhelmed the way that they were in New York City during the first wave, some of these governors, they're going to have to bite the bullet and announce that they're moving backwards. You could call it reclosing their economies. And like I mentioned, you don't want to reclose an economy because the economy, they're never meant to be shut down. But I should mention in all fairness that this is likely going to happen in both blue states and red. I'm just warning you right now. So that should at least spread the political blame game around a bit. State politics aside, though, how will it affect the presidential race? For the past month, Donald Trump has decided to focus his campaign efforts on announcing his Great American Comeback. President Trump briefly faced down all of the scientific weenies who didn't know what they were talking about and threw the doors of the mighty American economy wide open again. And everyone lived happily ever after. That was the plan at any rate. Donald Trump gambled on there being no second wave or a second wave only developing in the fall. And that was because he saw some very positive economic numbers throughout the summer. That plan is fast becoming inoperable. Obviously. Donald Trump, he gambled big. And he might just be about to lose this bet in an enormous way. Because if the viewpoint that Trump actually caused the second wave by forcing reopening to happen too early, then he's going to look like the villain rather than the savior by most of the public. And this will only serve to reinforce the image of Trump's pandemic response that has already set in. Trump gets very low marks for his handling of this crisis. Some polls are now showing that the public disapproves at the level of 2 to 1 against those who think Trump has done a good job. And that was before the second wave appeared. How many, poor, how many more people are going to decide Trump Trump bungled his response if the economy has to shut it back up again. For the past few weeks, Donald Trump and his administration and his campaign team have all decided that they are bored with this pandemic. And they would rather talk about something. Trump speaks as if the crisis is fading into the past. His advisors echoed his head in the sand viewpoint. The coronavirus daily White House briefings were abandoned weeks ago. Newsflash! We're going to have one tomorrow. And I'll talk about that um, as we get into the end of this uh, vlog. Astonishingly, just when Texas has experienced its biggest spike yet, the Trump administration now wants to close down the handful of drive through testing sites they've been paying for in Texas. Trump himself complained at a rally that he is begging his scientists to slow down all the testing so that the numbers look better for him. Trump's campaign team mocks Joe Biden for still practicing social distancing while Trump boldly strides before chairing audiences in two states where caseloads are going through the roof. Let's talk about Oklahoma, where he had his big rally last weekend. Yeah, so much of a big rally, right? You couldn't even sell out a 20,000 arena. 
And then you went to Arizona. I'm not even going to talk about that. But what is Trump going to do if it be becomes painfully apparent that not just the pandemic, but the economy as a whole is now entering the halfway point through a W-shaped recovery? If we're in the middle of a W, then we're about to head right back down a hill. We just climbed back up. That is going to absolutely destroy Trump's remaining campaign feed. It's pretty hard to campaign on the great American recovery when the, when the economy is collapsing for a second time. And it's hard to see what Trump will have left to shift to if we do reach this point, which could come very rapidly if the current slope of the pandemic chart is any indication. What will he have left to fall back on? The public already, you already know by a two-to-one margin thinks Trump bungled his initial response to the crisis. If people stop thinking, boy, if we had just waited another month, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Then they're going to stop blaming Trump for the second wave as well. If all Trump has left in his bag of tricks is to try to crack down on people pulling down Confederate statues. That's simply not going to be seen as relevant to most voters. Which is more worrisome, after all, that your parents or grandparents may die or whether Robert E. Lee will still tower over the town square. All Trump has done this week to address the question is to throw one of his hand grenades into the media conversation in a desperate attempt to distract everyone from reality. But no matter how many times he calls this the Kung Flu virus. Yeah, so everybody wants a Kung Flu virus because it spreads like lightning. Every time the guy says Kung Flu virus, you got to think the guy is a racist. And the hate that he has towards Asian Americans. And no matter how many pundits take this bait and get outraged, this doesn't address the second wave's reality one tiny bit. Picking an unnecessary racist fight isn't exactly going to calm voters' worries in any way, to state the obvious. Trump gambled on reopening the economy too early. His administration issued guidelines for states to use to measure when they could move through the phases of reopening. And then Trump and his team not only flat out ignored all of the guidelines, but they actively pushed governors to ignore them too. Virtually every state that relaxed its restrictions. And I'm talking about the red states and the blue states. And they did so before meeting the appropriate guideline. So we're beginning to pay the price of those decisions. Trump is on the brink of losing this gamble. And lose it in a way that makes him look even worse for recklessly gambling with thousands of American lives. Sooner or later, Trump is going to be forced to face the reality of a second wave. He has not done so yet, because he still ridicules the pandemic and speaks of it in the past tense. This guy pats himself on the back for his perfect response, in fact, and treats it as a crossed-out to-do list item. The virus, of course, doesn't care about any of that. It's going to spread whether it helps Donald Trump or it hurts him. But once Trump is forced to face the new reality, he's going to have to then come up with a whole new theme for his political campaign. Because leading the great American recovery just isn't going to work anymore.
that's it for this tonight. Um, what I'm going to try to do tomorrow, uh, of course tomorrow, is the uh, Coronavirus Task Force Briefing. They say it's going to be um, Friday morning, so um, I'll try to do a video on that tomorrow night, and um, or tomorrow afternoon, whatever, and talk about my thoughts on this whole... Um, what we should be doing. Until then, stay safe out there. And for the 649 lives that we lost today to this pandemic, please put those people in their prayers. And for anyone that had lost a family member, those 126,780 people, pray for them. Have a good night.